So last week we began, it's a very important, very important um, study. So if you missed it or you were not here, make sure you go to our, um, the, the one that's up there is from a couple years ago, right? The video that's up there. Make sure you go to our YouTube channel and go to the live and then go to last week's study. We usually only leave them up for a week, but because we've been so many people coming in, um, new students, and pretty soon we're going to cap that. Watch, because there's an important thing there about the character gap, right? I think it was a revelation to some of you of why we work on character, but also how character works, right? And you, you've heard certain things um, that you guys might want to cut the feed there. Um, you've probably heard that if we sow a thought, you reap an act. If you sow an act, you reap a habit. If you sow a habit, you reap character. If you sow character, you reap destiny. That's another way of saying closing that character gap, right? Uh, as, you're, as you're going through this. But it's not just closing the character gap. The reason that, it, that a discipleship and a mentorship has such power and that you guys are buying in is because it doesn't happen overnight. It has to be something that's taught, discussed, becomes a belief, then, then you have to set it as a conviction that you want to reach for, and then it has to be reinforced and emulated through that time. <clears throat> so Romans 6, 6, 17 through 19 says this, but God be thanked that you were slaves of sin, yet you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you uh, present your members as slaves of uncleanliness and of lawless, lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, now, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. You, you know what he's saying here, just what we learned about the character gap, right? The more that you desire it and the more that you present yourselves and the more times you make the choices in the right direction, you begin to close that character gap. Where stealing becomes repugnant to you, but not just that it's repugnant, but you do it, and then you repent, and there's no change. It says when you present your members, it means your body, soul, and spirit, right? Not just your hands, not just your feet. But every part of you, you present it to the Lord. If you present it for lawlessness or unrighteousness, you become a slave to it. It becomes your nature. It becomes your normal choice without thinking about it. But as you take this and you present yourselves uh, and all your members as instruments of righteousness, and you're making that choice, presenting yourself means that you're standing before the Lord, you're standing before yourself, you're standing before the Holy Spirit, you're standing before the Word of God, and as circumstances come up, you're examining your heart, and then you're presenting, you're, you're saying, I'm here as your, as your servant, I'm here uh, to make myself honorable, I'm here to bring forward the kingdom of God. And as you do that time and time again, what happens, and I love this word because at first, it's kind of like, why do they use that term slave? I'm a slave to righteousness. That, that almost has a bad commentation, like, all right, you know, you know, the taskmaster that's forcing me to do what's right. That's not what it's saying. It means that like a bondservant, it means that it becomes your, your nature. It becomes something, by nature, I mean, you don't have to debate within yourself. It just begin, it's something that you are driven by, your, your, your heart, your soul, your commitment, right? It, it's your conviction. It's who you are, that you're not going to do that thing. So in, in going through this, focusing in, right, on the right thing, take the, take the, the uh, borrow the best, chuck the rest, is I tried to find the best resources 
in, the, in these categories that I think are the most important for life and ministry. It doesn't mean I agree with every single thing that person says or that they stand for. But they're the best. They're all good audiophiles. And if I find something better from a, from a good teacher, uh, I, I include that and, and take out the, purge the other one. And so what you're getting is, is high caliber stuff. But I don't want you derailed because there's one thing you didn't get or one thing that's, that's defeating the purpose of you becoming a servant of righteousness, right? C.S. Lewis, he put it in such eloquent words. Let me read a C.S. Lewis quote to you. It's a little bit long, but it's so good. Listen to this, C.S. Lewis. Use the image of, of central core, right, for this very thing. And he says, people often think of Christian morality as a kind of bargain in which God says, if you keep a lot of rules, I'll reward you. But if you don't, I'll do the other thing. I do not think that is the best way of looking at it. I would much rather say that every time you make a choice, you are turning the central part of you, the part of you that chooses, into something a little different from what it was before. And taking your whole life, or taking your life as a whole, uh, with all your innumerable choices, all your life long, you are slowly turning the central thing either into a heavenly creature or a hellish creature, either into a creature that is in harmony with God and with other creatures and with itself, or else into one that is in a state of war and of hatred with God and of its fellow creatures and with itself. To be the kind of creature, to, uh, to be the kind of creature is heaven, that is, it is joy, peace, and knowledge and power. To be the other means madness, horror, idiocy, rage, impotence, and eternal loneliness. Each of us at each moment is progressing to the one state or the other. The choices you make today determine your character. And we will take our character with us into eternity. Therefore, you must choose wisely. Eating, whatever you eat, you slowly become, right? You are what you eat, and, and every choice makes, makes a big difference. And so we're going to need to turn to, to 1 Timothy 3. If you don't have your Bibles open yet, go ahead and turn to that. And why are we going through this? Well, I'm not called to be a pastor, right? I'm not called to even be a deacon. It don't matter. The qualifications for pastor deacon are not qualifications for leaders. They're qualifications for every Christian. And only people who push their character gap to a place where they're consistent in these areas are allowed to be leaders. Sabe? You getting what I'm saying here? So if... The reason I can say that is it's the standard for all Christians because if I'm not a pastor, then does that mean I can have more than one wife? Does that mean I can be angry? Does that mean I can be a drunkard or rough or covetous? No. It's the standard for all Christians. The point that Paul is making is, look, there's very few that will get it, very few that will push themselves, very few that understand it's by grace, but the grace compels me to become a better person. The grace compels me to put on Christ Jesus. The grace compels me to be more in the image of God, right? It was effaced, not erased at the fall. But God wants to carve out that image again. 
He wants to make you more like Christ. And like we said, you can't have meaningful relationships with stinky character. You can only have meaningful, rewarding relationships with good character. And God wants the best relationship he can have with you. And that's why the main reason why he pushes holiness. Holiness is just another way of saying character. He wants to stop evil. That's loving, right? But he's pushing us into that into that mold to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, which is what takes time and going through, but it's got to filter its way down into our heart, and then it becomes part of our central nature and person. And then slowly, it becomes a conviction. We become servants to it, not in a bad way. We become enslaved to it because it's just who we are, and we enjoy serving lawfulness and joy and love rather than serving evil and hatred and miserableness, right? So as we go through this, be thinking not only for myself, and this isn't an exercise in condemnation. You are going to get a test. It's not graded, but you're going to get a, a, a character test coming up, and you fill that out, and basically it's going to go through these things we're covering, right? Right? And it's going to say, on a scale of 1 to 10, where are you in this? Because if you don't measure something, you never improve. So that gets sent to me, but it has no name on it. So I begin to see you guys. And then at the end, towards, as we get towards the end, you get this test again. And it's amazing how much guys have grown in these two years. It's amazing. It's so thrilling for me to see. And you'll pick it up on one another. You don't necessarily see it in yourself because we're so critical of ourselves, right? But it's like putting the, the child against the, the door uh, post or the door, you know, and you mark their height and they grow and they don't see themselves grow and they can't see the scale until they get back and they look and it's grown a little bit more and a little bit more, right? But you'll grow in these, these next two years and we're almost a month we're already a month in, you guys. It's going to go so incredibly fast. So as we go through this, I want you to be thinking about your own personal character, but then also be thinking of anybody. If God's put you in ministry, this is one of the key things you're supposed to be doing. Not just leading people to Christ, but he says, teach them how to obey all those things I've commanded. But that isn't like legalistic. It's like teach them how to become disciples, how to put on Christ, how to change their life, and how to make their life better. But then also that trickles down to your spouse, your workplace, your kids. Now that you know this concept, you need to be thinking in each place, well, how can I help my, how can I help my children put on Christ? raise the character how can i teach them in such a way as to raise and elevate their convictions right and then their belief system and then push push that gap close that gap for them we intuitively kind of do that and we try to train our kids right but now that you know these concepts and you're going to get the tools especially starting next module next quarter that's what you want to do so Let's jump into this. I'm going to read the full qualifications and we're going to kind of combine them as we go through because they overlap a lot. 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 13, this is a faithful saying, if a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle. Not quarrelsome, not covetousness. One who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? And not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside 
lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Then there are deacons. Likewise, deacons must also be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let these also first be tested, proven. Let them serve as deacons being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanders, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. So we're looking at these types of leadership. Bishops are, it can be overseer, shepherd, pastor. Uh, pastor can be an elder, but, um, you know, elders are not necessarily pastors, right, or deacons. So a lot of these words are used interchangeable in, in Scripture, and I think there's a reason for that because we shouldn't get caught up in titles and you listen to... Um, Gail Irwin and Jesus style, right? And he mentions that. Uh, but sometimes you need the title because you need the authority to carry out what God has called you to do. But if you have character, that authority is oftentimes granted. You just, it's granted because there's respect in the person. And that person then is occupying an office, right? And that office would be deacon, pastor, bishop, whatever you want to call them, right? But you usually have one primary pastor. We're going to get into that much later on. We'll talk about that. But Paul wrote to Timothy and Titus, right? And then you see 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4 mentioned some of these same things. The elders who are among you, I exhort, I am who I am uh, a fellow elder. So here's Paul, or excuse me, here's Peter, an apostle, right? But he also calls himself an elder, right? And a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. The shepherd of the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion. Shouldn't be forced into that. You shouldn't force your heart into that, but willingly and not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Nor is being lords over those who entrusted you, but being examples to the flock. And when the, sh and when the chief shepherd appears, you'll receive the crown of glory, which does not fade away. So it's pretty, pretty obvious that the qualifications, when it talked to Paul, when you, when you see Peter, um, the qualifications, except for one, all have to do with character. And the one is an ability, and that's ability to teach. Why is that important? How do you communicate character and help other people if you can't communicate it well, right? So ability to teach isn't just to expound on Scripture. It's to be able to lead people into a love relationship with Jesus and to become more like him. All the other things fit underneath that. Doctrine, right? Going through uh, the, the different functions of the gifts of the Spirit and everything else. So... Let's look at, uh, it talks about deacons. Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, it says, And Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. So he does make a distinction between them, right? Bishops and deacons. Pastors and elders, if you want to say. Uh, the qualifications for office, for deacons, are almost as stringent as the pastor. Why? It becomes more stringent the more public it gets. So, just as a side note, for a church and, and, and somebody who's doing like they're on a, uh, a pastoral board seeking to hire a pastor, they should be going through references and seeking what's going on with that individual and where they stand character-wise before they have any discussion about doctrine. Because they can have solid doctrine. Matter of fact, many of the Pharisees had pretty solid doctrine. They just didn't follow it up with practice. They could tell you what to do. Jesus said, do what they say, don't do what they do, right? Because they're still 
given the word of God, they just couldn't exemplify it. They couldn't, they couldn't demonstrate it. And so God's given you a place of authority, whether it be at the workplace or you're, you're in ministry or you're, you're a parent, you're a husband. You have a responsibility. And our goal is to become not to set the bar low. Well, I'm never going to be in a, a pastorship. I'm never going to be an elder. Well, you don't know that, for one thing, right? He may call you, and then you need to step up. But the other thing is, why set the bar low? In the most important test, in the most important challenge in the history of mankind and in your life, why set the bar low, gentlemen? Why try to say, why, why try to compromise in things that, that it's got you and, and it has your heart and you become an instrument of unrighteousness? And, and it bothers me when pastors try to argue, oh, I'm free to drink, I'm free to smoke, I'm free to cuss. The emergent church, new age church, whatever you want to call it. But remember what we taught last week, whatever, whatever the leader, whatever the authority allows in, in, in minimal terms, right, is taken by the disciples or the children and used to in excess. If you're the standard and, you're, and your standard is way down here, my standard can be down here. What happens if, if the... If the Lock rises and all the boats float. And the standard comes up for everybody. Because that is the standard. God is graceful. This isn't, this, isn't about, this isn't about your value to God. This isn't about whether you'll be, um, I was going to say successful, but it, there, a, a lot of success will stem from having great character, right? But even sometimes when we fail big time, but our heart is leaning towards character, God will sometimes turn that into something that is a blessing and success despite our failures. Like with David, how he redeemed the situation with David in the end with even with Samson being able to take out the enemies and fulfill his role as a, as a judge, judged himself in, in the midst of that, right? But this is also when you speak to your children, when you speak with your wife, if you're like, well, she doesn't respect me. Are you respectable in the standard that God's given? And how can you love your wife completely if you're not raising your standard of your character? Because with poor character, you can't love to the greatest degree. It's impossible. So you begin to see why this is so important, why you should be getting excited. I don't want you down. You should be getting excited because as because we're going to help you. You're going to help. We're going to help each other, right? As we grow in character, your life is going to excel. Your relationship and love relationship with God is going to grow. The blessings on your family and your coworkers and your extended family is going to blossom. This is a good thing, you guys. This isn't a burden. And so the servant nature kicks in. And remember, the difference between competence and character. You can have competence without character. It's not going to get you very far, right? So far as the wind takes a sailboat. Or worse, right, the... Uh, uh, glider or hang glider because after the wind stops with the, with the glider, you come down to earth, right? You come down pretty hard. So this is essential. Let's look at this. Deacon, diakonos means just humble servant. In some of the modern church uh, interpretations, it's church helper, assistant officer. Uh, it's not a glorious title and reverent is supposed to be about character. I know it's picked up by certain denominations and it's out there and there's a lot of people who carry that, that title that are not prideful. But reverend is just supposed to be a reflection that you're respectable. 
I like pastor better because it's my responsibility, right? And it's less critique of my character and more my responsibility of taking care of the sheep. Uh, reverend can be a hindrance in, to some people who see that as um, something that's kind of prideful and not Christ-like. So doesn't have to be avoided in certain in certain communities uh, it's very acceptable and it's not offensive but in other places it can be but the role of a deacon is basically to be under a pastor's oversight but to be um, able to lift the hands and the arms of a pastor uh, pick up where the workload, where the pastor can't keep up, right? In Acts chapter 6, they wanted the, the apostles to come out and take care of the situation, waiting on tables for the, for the Hellenistic widows, the widows who spoke Greek. They thought they were being shortchanged. And the, and the leaders came out and said, hey, um, it's just not viable for us to do that. We have to give ourselves to prayer and to the word. So choose from among you these deacons, these elders who could come up and do the job, right? So, but I'll tell you, deacons, assistant pastors, uh, these kind of guys, some of you are going to end up in this role or assistant to somebody in ministry uh, when you're assisting your wife, uh, helping her fulfill her calling in ministry in the family. You're unsung heroes, man. You're the guys who make it happen. Honestly, most pastors will have a dream, they'll have a vision. They can't pull it off by themselves. There's no one man that can pull it off. So God brings the wrong character individuals who are talented, who are gifted in like administration, in helps, right? In wisdom. In those areas that, that the Holy Spirit is gifted, that they've used their past um, employment and and training and education to be used in the church. And they, they make it happen. When I was back at, at Calvary Chapel Golden Springs and our pastor, he said, hey, we, we need books out. We need these kind of things. I was in that thing, in, in the, the team that was putting the books together. We're going to take the audio files and we're going to transcribe them. And then from, it was before Dragon Speak and Speak to Ted text you know speech to text so you literally had to pay somebody to put on the and do shorthand and then translate in then an editor goes in and then somebody who can find the publisher and somebody who can put in a binding and then do any of the artwork and get certain things approved and and that took a whole team to put that together and we're putting out these books right booklets and some larger books and even putting a movie and stuff together. There's no way he could do that. Very talented guy. Very loving, very very passionate for the Lord, but there's no way he could do that. No way he could make the ministry run. We've got 14,000 people coming to the, to the church. No way he can minister all of them and carry that load. God brings in. But if you took that team away, that church would fold. It would immediately fold because there wouldn't be anybody... To, to keep it running and keep the ministry going, right? He could open up the doors, but he couldn't get the sound system on. I mean, he, there's, it's just no way for him to function and bring that in, right? So really, it's the parts of the body and they complement one another. But the body has to, can't be spastic. It has to have the character. It has to be loving relationship with one another, which you guys learned. Just two things. First is, when you guys complete this, uh, uh, it was on your application and stuff, but when you complete this, it doesn't mean any of you are, are, are ordained. Right? That's a calling of God. I can't just say that goes against the very thing we're teaching, right? Hey, they've got this knowledge. I'm going to lay hands on them, ordain them. No, that has to be the character. And it has to be a calling. That's why we started with calling, right? And really, if you're in another church, it has to be your church recognizing that 
God is raising you up and has to be the calling and function that's going on there, right? So we have ordained some of our guys as they go out and plant churches and do different things. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm not saying it could never happen or God would open the doors. We've done it with a, with a number of students. It just, it's not a guarantee. So you understand that. Then lastly, before you go on a break, is uh, it's a hard movie to watch, and I'm not necessarily recommending it. A long time ago, and I saw the TV version, so I don't know if there's something else in there, but you know the Saving Private Ryan. That's a hard one to watch for me. And here's Private Ryan, all his other brothers died, and they sent this, this group of men out, right, in, in World War II, I guess based on a true story, to retrieve him and bring him back because they had this kind of um, military rule that if that if there was the only son um, and only one left that they would they would give him a honorable discharge so he could take care of his family and one by one they get injured severely or they lose their life right and the and the last guy when they have him and he's he's dying and he's going to be taken home he grabs a hold of him and he says what you guys remember Earn it. Live your life well, right? Because these men died for you. Hey, there's somebody far more important than a platoon that died for you and I. Far more important. And he wants us to live our life well, right? He wants us to live our life well. Let's take a break. Father, Thank you for these gentlemen. I pray that you would bless the food they're about to partake in and that you would use us as your instruments of righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, by the way, as we come back, I'm going to pass along a paper. It's going to ask for um, your, if she wants, your wife's or your girlfriend's contact information, right? And that contact information so my wife can begin to disciple them. They, they, have, they meet once to twice a month, and they have dinners and stuff. So I'll put that paper. We pass it around. When you do it and you write it out, can you have the person next to you read that to you? So because, right, because if you write out, especially email addresses, your R might look like an A, or if the, if the guy next to you can't read that, I, I won't be able to read it either, right? So, so print it out really nice for me, right? And then, uh, so we'll, when you guys come back, we'll pass that around as you sit down. All right, God bless you. See you in a bit. 15 minutes. Well, I don't think we've got to, we, don't, we haven't gotten to number one yet. Well, you didn't do, you, jumped, you went to two right away? No, we haven't got to well, blameless. Paper, it's on the paper, it shows blameless first before it comes. Mm -hmm. We haven't even touched blameless yet. We haven't even taught that yet. Oh, okay. So, under two instructions. Well, let me show you on this. No, we haven't even got there yet. Okay, okay. You just jumped ahead. Huh? You just jumped. <laughs> X is up there.
We're ready. We're ready to go. As we're going through this, we haven't even got to the fill-ins yet. We're just getting there. So that was all leading up to what you have in there. So we're right there at uh, 2, Roman numeral 2. No, we didn't. No, you didn't. We haven't even taught it yet. No, no, you didn't. All right. No, we're on. We're on a blameless number one. <laughs> Stop messing with these guys. We're at blameless. So we're going to cover bishop and deacon together as we go through. So blameless number one here. Blameless does not mean perfect but striving towards inoffensive relations. Blameless does not mean perfect, but striving towards inoffensive relations. Synonyms. Blameless means irreproachable, faultless in reputation, but not perfect. Well, how could it be faultless? How could it be this? Here's what it means. It means that You put yourself, we're sinners, so when we fall or we harm or we hurt somebody, um, that we do everything we can within, within reason and with respect to that person to try to rectify the situation. So if it's somebody gets offended, you apologize. But you don't apologize for giving the word of God, right? Well, Jesus is offensive. Well, then, then you're still blameless because, well... That's just your, your issue, right? It's not something I did what I'm supposed to do. But it means that when you know of an offense or an occurrence where you where you're honestly are at fault or even partly at fault, that you try to make it right, if they refuse, then you're blameless because you tried to you honestly made an effort to, to make it right. That this is what it means, right? So that but that's You could also say in this segment, blameless is humility. Because you have to say, I'm sorry. You have to admit that you're wrong. You have to, you have to humble yourself and go before that person or that group or that, that, that place and say, hey, um, I want to make this right. God challenged me this week, this last week is shepherd school starting, right? We used to be on the air uh, a couple different things. We had no other doctrine radio program. Then we had cross points, which was a verse-by-verse teaching. Uh, Right after the pandemic, we decided to take it off, but we ended it in November. Uh, I sent an email saying, hey, we're ending it. But the radio station got, still got four um, edited radio programs from from, uh, our... um, radio producer so we put out the Sunday morning study and we had a professionally edited right and they're always a month in advance so they send it so they they assume that we no, we're still on and going and they they aired them during that time and then I got a bill for that and I'm like wait a minute we we've ended this uh, relationship in November it shouldn't be airing and uh, uh, we were pushing the shepherd school at that time And um, that's, we had uh, said, hey, we'd still like to have that go on. And they were airing the wrong, the wrong commercial. They were from two years ago. So it was saying it's starting in August when it was actually starting in January. So we talked about it, whatever. And they said, oh, don't worry about it. You know, this is December 2020. Don't worry about it. Um, That month is gone, right? So we're running some commercials for this shepherd school coming up some of you might have heard it on k light and uh they they sent me another bill saying oh we saw that you have this past debt with us and i'm like no i took care of that here's the emails here's the whole thing and i even to make sure everything was right i was on the air doing albuquerque connect in january and uh for our valentine's dinner and I wanted to make sure, so I sat there in the studio waiting. To, I said, just absolutely make sure. Can you please talk to accounting? Uh, I'll go talk to him if you want. I want to make sure that this is resolved. And I got, oh, it's resolved, right? So here, three years, t- 
two years later, I get this bill, right? Immediately, I'm like, oh, my gosh. You know, like, ah. Here's the reasons why I don't need to be paying this. You know, we, I thought this was resolved. And then God just spoke to me and said, are you blameless? I mean, you're going to be teaching it in a couple, couple uh, like in a week, right? You're going to be teaching this. I thought, oh, my goodness. That's $700, man. That's a big chunk coming out. And, and I was like, I'm not arguing. That very night, like at midnight, I, I sent off a check and I sent an email going, hey, wh whatever you guys decide is fine. If you want to cash this, it's fine. If you would do, I just don't want any issues between ministries or people, right? So a, a check is coming your way. Like, a, the, you know, I'm sorry that there's a misunderstanding. Um, to their credit, they're going, they, they emailed me back going, hey, Pastor Scott, look, we discussed this and you gave your reasons. We, we, I've only been in the accounting for, for a little while. I didn't know that that was agreement was there. And so, look, uh, we're going to clean up our books and you're, you're not going to owe anything. We're going to We're going to mail your check back. It's just, God had to, to rebuke me, right? Had to talk me into it, but it's the right thing to do. Because one of the reasons I like teaching this class is it makes me grow and holds me accountable. So, being blameless has power in it. If I had any future dealings with, with that church or with the radio station or other things, even though they're like, yeah, we took care of it, but they're not like, there's still the ill feelings. I didn't want those ill feelings. And, and it's the same thing. You, you, you need to be blameless, but it also gives you the power to minister because you got a clear conscience. Spurgeon want, was once, um, they tried to blackmail him. They sent him a letter and said, at this time in this place at this railroad station, <clears throat> we want you to deposit this much money or we're going to tell the world. We're going we're gonna to have it printed and everything, you know, your, your, uh, your sins. We've got, we've got dirt on you. Now, for most people, if you get that, you'd think, hmm, I wonder what they have on me, right? And you could probably name a few things. Right? You could probably go through it. That pretty embarrassing. You don't want the world to know. He wrote him a note back and placed it in that place. And he goes, publish it to the world, everything you have. I don't have anything to hide in Christ Jesus. Because he was blameless. That's one of the reasons he could teach with such power in that. God, after all these times, nearly 80 years or more or what, he, it's almost a century here. He still has books that are being published because the power of, of the word and the devotion that he has morning by morning, right? Evening by evening. It's just powerful. Secondly, deacon. Number two here. Reverent means worthy of honor. Dignified, decent, etiquette. Uh, propriety, propriety, excuse me stateliness, elegance, grace. These, these are virtue titles, right? A virtue calling. They're supposed to be reverent. Not necessarily called reverent, right? As a title. <coughs> but it should be attached to their name. It should be attached to our person, right? Each one of us as a Christian should be blameless. should be blameless in your marriage gives you power when you're teaching and training your children. Reverent means to have that. Um, means to be like excellent in spirit, have merit, virtuous, ethical, moral, noble. Contrasted words would be impropriety, indecent, indecorum, unseemingly offensive or rude. Right? So the opposite of reverent would be to be a rude person. Don't, you really don't have honor. Deacons must then be worthy of respect. Carry, in other words, carry yourself with class, you guys. Carry yourself with composure. 
um, at all times. Not just for show. So, being in California, being on a very large church, a lot of places would contact us that just for various things because, hey, we know this reputation of this church and, and this sort of thing, and they can handle this. So we got a call from uh, a very, very large uh, funeral home mortuary that's out there, and they said, we have this request. Uh, it's delicate. It's, it's a situation where a woman who had married an American, she came across the border when she it, uh, when he found out she was pregnant, uh, he, he beat her so badly, she was put in the hospital and she lost her child, a, a little girl. And um, so we're going to uh, bury this child because she delivered the child. And, and um, she requested that the hospital not just toss the baby, right, in the trash. A lot of hospitals do. This is LA County. And so would, would you be able to send someone out to do a funeral? She's Spanish speaking, uh, but she does speak a little English. She doesn't mind if it's in English. But can you have a little worship? So we said yes. And they... They paid, the mortuary paid for a, it's a baby coffin. It's about the size of a shoebox. I didn't even know these things existed. And we helped along, like, what can we do? Well, we, can you buy clothes? And the, the baby was so small, we actually could buy Barbie doll clothes to put on this little girl who, who was born and she had injuries from her, her father hitting her through the womb of her. So the mom's there, we show up. I got a young worship leader, pastor, who shows up with us, right? The mom's there. She's got bandages across her head and her eye. He almost put uh, her eye out, punching her so hard. She lost a tooth. I get there first, you know, meet her. The assistant pastor pulls up. I'm an assistant pastor too, worship leader, he gets out of the car, he's just in jeans, he's in, he's in his um, a t-shirt, which he likes to, I'm working on music, I'm working on worship, man, has his guitar, he's wearing dark glasses, and he's chewing gum, he walks up there, and like, what, what am I supposed to play? He looks at, what, what am I supposed to play? I about punted him across the 10 freeway. I said, excuse me, we'll be right back. Because he's up there standing there. Ah, what am I supposed to play? Got his shade still on. I dragged him back behind his VW bus and I say, spit out your gum. He's like, what? I go, spit out your gum. <laughs> he spit it out. I said, now pick it up. I said, this woman was beaten almost near death by her husband. Her husband beat her so bad he killed his own child. We're burying her. You need to show some dignity. This is what reverent means. This means having etiquette, having some class, having some nobility. You need to go back to her. You need to apologize. You need to ask her name instead of what am I supposed to play? Ask her what she would like to hear. I sent you an email with some of her requests. And see if you can play it with some dignity. Oh, he was mad at me. And I said, do you see that box that they're carrying? Yeah. I said, that's, that's her baby, man. She was lied to. She was beaten near death. We learned a valuable lesson. But I'll tell you what, this guy to this day is a senior pastor and he's leading with excellence. I'm not going to say it's just because that meeting, 
but I'm saying he, he got it after that. He was a youth minister, doing worship, raised up, sent out, planted a church, which is hard to do, and, and he grew, grew it, and to this day he's still, he's still pastoring. But he wouldn't be had he not changed. He wouldn't have been on staff for very long. That's a person who's respectable, a person who can hold his emotions and not wear them on his sleeves. When you hear bad news, you instantly slump and go, why me? That's not reverent. That's not etiquette. That's not noble. You stand there. You don't overreact. You don't underreact. You receive things. You handle things. You handle disappointments. You examine them and Wonder what God's going to do. You don't blame others. You don't deflect. I, I, man, I see this all the time, you guys. They get, they're competent or they can fog a mirror. So, hey, you're doing ministry, right? I was invited to a seat group, which is one of the Christian clubs at the high schools. And they had a panel of uh, four pastors that were, were to come in and, and uh, the students could come ask questions and they were handing out uh, cards weeks in advance. Really good job that these students did because they could ask anything. And so all these kids came in to hear what, what was about to be said. And, and there was about 300 kids and we got the small auditorium for this. So there was uh, an older pastor that was there there was a pastor from a Unitarian church. Um, she uh, was there as a representative of them. Then we had a youth pastor who was on. It was one of the youth pastors for one of the mega churches in the area. And then, and then me. And the kids would ans ask all these questions, or s somebody would take the card that if the kid didn't want to answer the question or ask the question, they were a little embarrassed or whatever, then the question, then the moderator would read, read it, and we would have to answer the questions, right? And you'd get all, I mean, just all kinds of, it was a little embarrassing because Unity Church isn't even Christian. They, they deny the deity of Jesus Christ. So you had the older pastor who was trying his best. He's fumbling through the word, didn't really have an answer, and so he, he would, like, say some things that were wrong. Then the youth director was like, hey, this is my, these are my peoples, man. These are my peeps, right? I deal with these kids all the time. But his vocabulary, he was trying to like, hey, I'm going to connect with them. So he was the cussing pastor that was there. And I don't think he could get a sentence out without saying crap. And you know what happened over time? And the kids, they were only supposed to go 45 minutes, and we went nearly three hours. Because eventually the kids started saying, uh, can, can the guy in the end answer the questions? And after the one youth pastor said, crap for about the 500th time, one of the non-believing students in there goes, here's, here's amazing, they're going, Mm. I think he's just trying to get on our good side, but I want to hear what the truth is. Can you answer that question? And I answered it, but I didn't use that word. I said, well, here's, here's the fluff. I used fluff instead of that. And they stayed, and they stayed, and they stayed. But I'll tell you what, and look, most Christians, and I'll guarantee, when you guys are done, you could have answered it. Every, when you're done, you could have answered every single one of those questions. But as pastors and leaders, even if they couldn't answer them, they didn't have decorum. They didn't have nobility. They didn't have excellence. They didn't have any power in their speech or their character. And so it became a game of let's try and stump this guy, right? But then it became like people, even non-believers, started defending my answers. Now, that, 
I don't know how you put holes in that. I don't know how that made sense to me, right? It was pretty amazing what happened. Because I had somebody sit me down when I was going to Bible college, not in the class, but after class. I wish it was in the class. I wish we had a whole class like this. Sat me down and, and he talked to me about character matter, mattering. And that God is more interested in your character than he is your comfort. And you better get used to it. But the more character you have, the more comfortable you're going to be, even in difficult situations. I'm so thankful for that. Husband of one wife. B1, it says he is to be a one woman man. That's what it means. This is oftentimes taken and by some denomination saying, uh, well, if, you, if you've been married uh, you, and, and you divorced or whatever, or you're not with your wife, then you, you can't minister. But what it's saying is monogamous and that you're faithful. That you're a one woman man. So, in light of this, when the Catholic Church says a priest can't get married and you have to take a vow of celibacy, they're strictly going against Scripture. Well, in light of what the Pope has been saying recently, right? It's uh, pretty off the wall, anyways. But uh, it, it assumes, rather than stipulating that a, that a pastor or bishop or deacon would be a married man, right? It's accusative, the, the text saying, and we'll get into that when we get, how do you study the Bible? If married, then only one. That, that's what the passage is meaning. But does that mean that uh, somebody who has a wife that dies if a pastor has a wife pass away could he get remarried it's gonna have two two wives right romans 7 it's like the law under the law if 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 a spouse passes away then you're free from that obligation you're you're free in christ to marry somebody in christ right and so we've, we've had that. We've had to discuss that. We've had pastors or leaders in Calvary Chapel and in um, uh, the churches that I've been helpful in, in getting started or planting, whether a small part or a little part, of having to deal with this issue. And guys are condemned and people in the church don't understand. And Well, we're leaving the church. You're supposed to only be married to one woman. Yeah, one woman at a time under biblical exemptions, right, that are supposed to be there. But what about a divorced man? Can he be a deacon or be um, a pastor? What about if it's B.C. days? What if it's about before Christ? Uh, sins before that, are, are they not forgiven? Here's the way that um, the Bible lays it out, right? Sins in the past are forgiven, but there's consequences. You can forgive people, but there's still accountability. So if a guy says, hey, I want to be a pastor, but I've gone through a divorce, then what we would say is seek, seek uh, to reconcile with that woman. What if she doesn't want to? What if she denies Christ? then that would fit under abandonment that she doesn't want to reconcile and that she's rejected Christ and rejected you and doesn't want to live with you, then according to 1 Corinthians 7, you'd be free. But only after you made sincere, um, honest efforts, not one, but efforts to reconcile. What about, we've had a situation where a pastor very good, very loving teaching pastor. His, his wife was even involved in ministry, helped plant the church. She got into an accident, went on painkillers, got addicted to painkillers, uh, then denied Christ, left the house. Then she uh, got arrested for uh, forging prescriptions so she could get her, her pain meds. 
and was thrown in prison. Is, is he supposed to remain married to her? <laughs> He's quiet, huh? These are hard things, isn't it, to work through. We're going to teach you how to work through hard things in, in, the, in the sixth quarter. These are cliffhangers. I'm teasing you, right? But it's, we're going to teach you how to work through these difficult issues. But after a certain period of time, we, we sat down with this, with this pastor of a very large church, and we said, look, um, you shouldn't be seeking necessarily a wife unless God brings her to you, but uh, this wife has, has rejected you. She's rejected the church. She's, she's in prison. She's abandoned you. you. You have every legal right to move on, but you don't have to move on. And he went two years, would visit her, Weekly, finally she said, "I don't want you to. I don't want you to come here. I don't want you to see your face. I don't want to hear. I don't want you to bring a Bible or Bible studies or anything. We're done. We're through. I'm through with with church. I'm through with Jesus. I'm through with all this. You go your way. Don't ever show your face here again." So he quit going. About six months later. There was um, a love relationship that began to blossom. Uh, at this time, she had initiated divorce. She had divorced him uh, a year into her um, being incarcerated. So he's a year and a half removed. Is he allowed to marry? Biblically, he had grounds. It's, again, it's abandonment. And there's biblical precedent of Israel abandoning God and God writing a, a bill of divorcement. If you haven't studied that and divorce, it, it's very interesting. We'll go through it when we get into ethics. His church was like split, and so what he did is he had to leave. He went to Chicago and started a new church. Grew God's blessing. Why am I bringing that up? Because you're going to be in situations where maybe your background isn't perfect. Maybe you had an affair. Other things have happened. My own pastor, Rawl, he had an affair. If you know his story. He was an abuser. But God redeemed the situation. He repented. He came to Christ. But he wasn't faithful to one woman. He is now, after all these years, can God use that person? Can he redeem Peter? Can he redeem David? Can he redeem situation? He can redeem them. Sometimes there's consequences to this, but you have to go by the biblical commands and a biblical model that God has demonstrated, not only by his word, but by his example, how he operates. And that's how you're able to do that. The places where he can't redeem is where the, there's, a, there's a divorce, other things happen. It's not a reconcilable, uh, it, or it could be a reconcilable uh, situation, but they didn't try or attempt. One or both parties get married to someone else. They're not allowed biblically. Deuteronomy, I believe, 24 talks about it. They're not allowed to divorce and go back to their first spouse. God calls that an abomination. And the reason is because it, 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 it legalizes um, basically adultery. And God says that he, he doesn't, doesn't want that. C, temperate. Temperate means to have a general self-control. Balanced or stable rather than unbalanced and unstable. Having a general self-control, uh, being of sound disposition, not ill-tempered. can also mean being vigilant, well-balanced, self-restrained, self-controlled, moderate in spirit. So it means not being controlled by pride or by peer pressure. There's a lot of peer pressure in ministry uh, going on between different ministries, even ministries in church, peer pressure on yourself. Um, 
mental stability it rules out excess, right? It just means a person who's balanced, body, soul, and spirit, right? They're temperate. I had a guy who I ministered with back in California. We came out, we were planting the church here. Before we moved into these two suites, we had this suite over here, and we, we, we outgrew that suite. But we, we just had, we had three classrooms over there, <clears throat> small classrooms, and we were kind of desperate for people to, to work there. So we were saying, hey, we need volunteers in the children's ministry, something you hear all the time in church, right? We need volunteers in the children's ministry. And this guy got up. And I thought, oh, great, because he was in our Bible school, and I trained him on some of this stuff. And he, he approached me, he goes, hey, I'd, I'd like to go teach the kids and do this. He, and, and we were in the hallway uh, next door, and he, he said, but one thing I disagree with you about uh, on prophecy and on salvation, I disagree with those two, those two points, but it should be good. And at the time, what we were doing is to train our teachers, I would teach, they would be in the study, and then they would take my outline the next week, and they would be in the class with the kids, and they would just, in a very simplified way, teach what I taught the week before, right? That meant also the parents could answer any questions that the kids had. And I had just taught on something, he goes, well, I, I, I disagree with that. Kind of key, kind of key um, doctrinal issues, right? And I'm like, hmm. He goes, I'll just teach around that. I go, oh, you can't, because you have to teach what I just taught, right? And you said you just disagree with what I taught. So thank you for offering, but I don't think that's the ministry for you. We can get some other ministry. Oh, man, he, he lost it. He got me, and he started pushing me back towards one of the classrooms, started hitting me in the chest. You don't understand. You're not a godly man because you don't know that I have a calling on my life. And so you're not spiritual because if you were spiritual, you would know I'm supposed to be in the classroom teaching the kids. <laughs> what did I say? Oh, absolutely not. You just guaranteed. Not because you're offending me or you're sticking your finger in my chest. Because you just disqualified yourself. If you can't be temperate around me, your pastor, how are you going to be around the kids? How are you going to be around our kids? Our kids are precious. Deacon, not double-tongued. Timothy 3.8, likewise deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued. Not double-tongued means by dispensing, um, not being double-tongued also means dispensing only truth in a dignified manner. Dispensing only truth in a dignified manner proper speech, a sense of honesty. So a church leader, a staff leader, a father should not be known for double talk or saying one thing to one person and saying something else completely different to another person with intent to deceive or to make himself look good. Just shouldn't be. One of the things God busted me on on this is that um, people would ask me, oh, pastor, you know, what are you doing? And you're so busy and everything. And I'm like, yeah, I'm so busy because it sounds good, you know. I'm a super pastor. Shh, keep flying by. I'm so busy. Sometimes I, I was swamped. Other times, eh, not so much. Counseling is done. It's a topic that I'm well-versed on, studies done early. I, I got time to work on some other stuff. Leisurely read some of the books that I wanted to get to. But I wanted them to know I'm so busy. I'm, I'm super faster, right? And God's like, stop saying that. Stop acting like, if you're busy, tell them you're busy. If you're not, tell them, oh, it's a pretty easy week. I actually got to do some, some of my own fun stuff this week. Guess what? Nobody thought, well, how, wait, I can't say it. Nobody thought I wasn't a super pastor. No, nobody, nobody looked down on me, at least directly to me, right? Because that's an honest answer. I think we try to tell everybody, it's not just pastors. We try to let everybody know that we're busy because it kind of makes us feel important or that, you know, we're on top of things. We're, we're doing a lot of stuff for the Lord and for our 
it's okay sometimes to take a break. It's okay that if you're not so busy, right? God just busted me. You ain't so busy. Shh. Proverbs eleven thirteen: a tellbearer reveals secrets, but he who is of a faithful spirit conceals a matter. This also means this um, double-tongued is that what you hear stays with you unless it's absolutely necessary for you to, to share it with someone else, right? Uh, and that's what we said when we started class. What's shared in shepherd school, especially in the first 45 minutes, stays in shepherd school. It's one of the things. Not a slanderer or prideful. Psalm 101.5, it says, Whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. The one who has a haughty look and a proud heart, him I will not endure. So we don't allow ourselves to be vehicles of slander. Romans 3, 7 and 8, For if truth, if the truth of God is increased through my lie to his glory, why am I also still judged as a sinner? And why not say, let us do evil that good may come, as we are slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say their condemnation is just. Here's what Paul is dealing with. There's people in the church, and there's the Judaizers who are saying, grace, this grace thing? No, it's law. Paul is saying, hey, where grace abounds, sin abounds, uh, where sin abounds, grace abounds that much more. So therefore, logically, you should just go sin so that grace abounds, right? That's what Paul is teaching. He goes, that's slander. We're not teaching that. You know we're not teaching that. But it's coming from religious people and from other churches. They don't deserve to be in ministry. Deacons not to spread rumors. I'm not going to read it to you, but in Nehemiah, you have Sam Ballot, right? He has this open letter. He comes before Nehemiah and all the people. And he, oh, it's been reported. You've raised up prophets. You've, you've raised up these people and priests, and you're building this wall so that they can proclaim that there's a king in Israel, and you're trying to set yourself up as king, and we're going to send this back to um, uh, Xerxes so that he finds out, and he, you know, eventually what, what they mean is he'll put you to death. And he acts like Spurgeon. Nehemiah goes, broadcast, I don't care. There's no such thing that's going on. Right? He goes, because he knows he's a cupbearer. Xerxes will send a, a, a people down here to investigate. And when he does, he's going to find out, you're slandering, you're lying, and it'll be your head. That's what he's saying, right? That's what's going to happen. It allows you to call bluffs. Six things the Lord hates in Proverbs 6. These things the Lord hates, yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift to run into evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. American Legion magazine said, if you can't say anything good about a person, let's hear it. Different from what mama told you, right? John, John Bunyan, in prison, he wrote Pilgrim's Progress, but he also had a number of visions and other things that he wrote in sermons. And one of, the, one of the visions he had was that he saw a vision of someone who there was a fire uh, up against the wall by the door, and the guy was throwing water on it, throwing water on it, throwing water on it. And he was like, well, why isn't it going out? And the Lord revealed to him in the, in the same vision that there was a guy behind the door who was throwing oil on the fire. That's a tail bearer. That's why God says it's an abomination and why it needs to be dealt with. You don't just come out and say, well, that's a lie. If you're overseeing this, if it's, a, if it's one of your children, then you got to sit them down and correct them. Show them why this is so wrong and why it's so hurtful. If, if it's in ministry, you try to do the same thing. But if they don't change or they don't repent or they're still spewing the same thing, cut them off. 
want to tell you this. Don't waste your time. Get them out. If you've, if you've reproved them twice and they're contentious, Timothy and Timothy, it says, cut them off. Get rid of the talebearer because it's an abomination before the Lord and it destroys the work of God that's happening there. Because you know what? You know why this is an abomination? Because it isn't just it isn't just that person slandering someone else. It worms its way into everybody who's hearing this and causes there to be a character gap. It causes their character gap to stretch of pridefulness because that's what gossip is, right? Oh, did you hear what so and so did? Well, what? The reason we want to listen to that is, and our usually, our usually our comeback is, oh, I would never do that. That's a prideful statement, isn't it? I'm better than so-and-so. I'm smarter than so-and-so. But not in this area. That's a prideful thing. Pride, anger, hatred, division, all come from gossip and slander. It destroys character, destroys households, it destroys workplaces, it destroys ministry. And so if they're not going to repent, you're, uh, for the benefit of the family or the church or whatever, you need to address it quickly. And, it, and it, in certain circumstances, you have to ask the person to leave. for this, the sanctity of the place God's put you in charge of, right? And so that it's not destroying the character of someone else. Verse, or, uh, verse six of Psalm five, you shall destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and the deceitful man. This is hard, you guys. It's hard in family. It's hard during these times. It's hard, especially in ministry. And I'm going to tell you this a million times. One, that character, character is everything. Character matters. What's important? Character. Anytime I, I, I just leave a question wide open, even if you're not sure and you shout out character, you probably have the right answer. Okay. But it changes lives. It, it allows God to work. It, it gives you greater power when you're a person of greater character, like Moses having this meekness. God can work through him in a, in a greater way. He can work through the early church. We talked about that Acts chapter 5, why he, why he shut down Ananias and Sapphira so hard. And you just, you'll walk with a different sense of humility and work, but it, it's hard because ministry is messy. That's the other thing you're going to hear a lot from me. Ministry is messy. Life is messy. You're going to get hurt. You're not going to be honored. There are times where you're going to be grossly misunderstood. There are going to be times when you're very well understood but they don't want other people to understand you. And they'll, they'll say things behind your back or in front of your face. Ministry is messy. In the midst of the mess, you need to try to be Mr. Clean. Remember Mr. Clean? The scrubbing. Got no hair. I'm getting there, man. I'm pretty, pretty close to being Mr. Clean here. As soon as there's a few more up there, a few more stragglers are there. They're holding out, man. But Mr. Clean is, you clean up the mess. You just handle it with dignity. Ministry is messy, just expect it and handle it with dignity. When you do, you're just different. There's a guy, Joe Pisapone, he's, he's, a, was it F, he's an ex-FBI agent. He wrote a book about his work in undercover in the mafia. He spent two years undercover in New York mafia. He had to convince him he was a mafia guy. Until finally, FBI pulled him out, and they had all these RICO uh, 
suits that he could get with these guys because it was hard to pin them for the murders and other things. But they got him on some of those. But it's hard to get the boss man, right? But you get him on the RICO cross uh, state line charges and other things, tax evasion and all these other things. You can get him in prison with that. And he came out and he had to testify and do all these things. Then he had to go into witness protection. And it was interesting because one of the girlfriends of one of the mafia guys uh, told him when they were doing interviews, because he was doing debriefing and, and um, exit interviews with, as he was going, they brought people in. And he was tying things together for his reports and for them to put stuff together. And she sat down with him. She goes, I, I knew you weren't, I knew you were FBI. He goes, what? She goes, well, whether FBI or something like that, I knew you weren't a thief. And he, he said, why? Because you didn't carry yourself like the other guys. There's a certain sense of dignity in you. There's a cer certain sense of taking pride in doing things right, a certain sense of there's a certain level you wouldn't cross, right? And he goes, I, I could see through your rouge where you're trying to act like a tough guy and you're mean and you would steal and you, like, she's like, I, I could tell. You were just different from all the other guys. Man, if we can't be different as Christians, if we can't be different to where they're like, you're just different. I know some of you already, you're already there in many places, right? But we need to be even farther along so that at your workplace, at your household, even if your kids rebel, they go, they're not going to rebel because you're a hypocrite. They're going to, they're going to rebel and then regret it and go, well, dad and mom, they, you really couldn't fault them. They, they were the real deal, man. And if you're the real deal, that's why many times the kids come back after they've had their sowing their wild oats and doing things. They come back because they realized, hey, man, our parents are the real deal. At work, you need to be the real deal. The only way they find out you're the real deal is if you're tested in messy situations. Right? You're not going to be perfect. This is, this is a lifetime journey. But in these two years, just think about all the decisions you make. And as you go through, can you make more and more in a righteous, honorable, loving manner? Then you're closing that gap daily. You might fall two steps backwards. Right? Just keep closing it, man. Just keep working on it. And, and it, you'll, it'll be a blessing. It's a journey. Don't expect perfection. Just try to be better in each decision, each action, each reaction. Right? Each one. Got it? Any questions on, on this, what we taught tonight? No, they're sending it back. I haven't received it. It's so new. I'm just sharing fresh, man. This is like this last week. This is just days ago I got that email. So it's happening. I'm, I'm, you'll find out I, it's, it's real stuff I share. Yeah, he should be obligated. You should, for two reasons, right? When, when you have a Christian's divorcing or doing that, and in, um, even if there's biblical uh, reasons for it, like if she had committed adultery, she also has abandonment, um, and she did commit adultery, by the way, during this time for pain meds. You should be, you are obligated to be blameless, right? To try and reconcile. So that's part of being blameless. Try to reconcile. It needs to be an honest effort, right? An honest effort to try to get that. Uh, I can't put a time limit on it or whatever, but I, it, people need to see that there's an honest effort. And an honest effort means you go out of your way and even suffer and even swallow your pride in other things like Hosea in, Hosea in Scripture, in the book of Hosea, whose wife became a harlot and she had many lovers. 
that after God working on her, if she still refused, now Gomer came back to Hosea, but if she still refuses, then you're free because it's a biblical thing. But secondly, let's say that that pastor or anybody, Christian who goes through it, and there is a, there's a biblical reason to, to, to divorce that person, right? They committed adultery or they... The reason that you should put sincere effort to forgive and reconcile is because if they don't, and you're like, well, the divorce is going through, they divorced me or whatever. When God, when God works, and let's say God brings, uh, brings another spouse to that individual, right? That spouse is going to go, oh, you were divorced? I don't know if I can trust you. But if they sacrificially waited on the other person and tried and tried and tried and tried to restore their marriage, the character that person puts, puts should help to put at ease the heart of the person who's thinking that they'll marry, marry the divorced person, right? Because if they say, oh gosh, you know, they put all this effort in, I think you'd be faithful to me. But if he didn't, they may think, well, the first time I do anything wrong, they may accuse me of something and I'm, I'm, I'm divorced too, right? So it's important that that person sees the character and that they're blameless because if God does bring someone else later on, that um, there's a, it can really make, allow for there to be a true bonding and trust because without trust and security, especially for, for a wife and women, um, she, it's, it's rare for her to give her heart completely away because she just doesn't trust them with that. That's why in, in Hosea, God tells uh, Hosea when he receives Gomer back to give her security, to place her back in the house. She's not second rate. She's not, you know, like a, like a second wife or, you know, whatever. Um, she's put back in that place and he's supposed to speak softly or kindly to her. It could be rough and she's just going to endure it. It's hard for her to give her heart back. But when he's showing character, then God can make a bad situation and redeem it, right? And the best way to redeem situations is character. You guys are going to find that out. Any other questions? All right, let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you, Lord, for these gentlemen. I pray that you would bless, Lord, that you would guide. Make us all men of character, Lord, and then our families, and then our coworkers, and then in ministry, Lord. Work through us. Let us shine and reflect you, Lord. Let us be sons of light, that we reflect our Father, and therefore are called the children of heaven. We thank you for that. We thank you for this time together. Thank you for our brotherhood, Lord. Thank you for these guys in Kenya and Sri Lanka and Zambia, Father, Uganda. May you extend that far beyond our reach, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys.